Um, yeah, well, it's nice to be back after two years, and it's amazing what has happened with this seminar. It's extraordinary. I think we all greatly appreciate how it's kept us together over this difficult period. Um, I know some people are going back into the world. I'm not personally, but um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to more number 30 web seminar. So um, today's talk, uh, here we go for technology, there we go, um, is dedicated to the memory of these three gentlemen who, this is uh, the first Canadian Number Theory Association meeting in 1989, a uh, picture courtesy of Hugh Williams. And the gentleman left is Richard Guy, um, John Selfridge in the middle, and Alf van der Porten. Guy and van der Porten will feature in this talk. Um, Maybe I should mention, you can see that, that it was a dancing time back in 1989, the first CNTA. Um, you can also see the, the propensity in Canada for facial hair growth. Uh, I think the cold weather brings a lot of facial hair. Um, and you see Richard Guy has tamed his to go up his face, which is rather interesting. Anyway, besides that, so um, Richard Guy, you. For those who didn't know him, you may know his book, Unsolved Problems in Number Theory. Um, he was the great problem master of the uh, second half of the 20th century in number theory. And the dates there, 1916 to 2020, are not wrong. He, he died at the age of 104, fairly recently. And um, Carl Pomerantz and I had the opportunity to write a uh, obituary for him in the notices. And I took that as an opportunity to try and read through a lot of his papers. I mean, I sort of knew him best, obviously, as the problem man and somebody who liked to party at, at conferences. But um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting reading through a lot of his papers and seeing his fascination. And um, he was somebody who really loved pro certain problems. He was just fascinated by. He wasn't necessarily proving all his conjectures. In fact, he really focused on conjectures. He didn't understand what to do or didn't even necessarily know what he should conjecture, which I think is a wonderful thing to do, um, to really just want to understand the difficult problem. And I got kind of hooked on one of these problems, which I'm calling linear division sequences, which he has about four or five papers on. He also has beautiful papers of Andrew Bremner on tiny squares of triangles and uh, on aliquot sequences, perhaps better known in uh, multiplicative number theory that work. Anyway, but we're going to talk today about recurrent sequences. So um, we'll start with the grandfather of them all, the Fibonacci numbers, which I hope you know well. Um, of course, they're linear recurrent sequence because they satisfy linear recurrence equation. And the property that's important for us today is they also satisfy that the nth element of a sequence divides the nth element of a sequence whenever m divides n. If you ever played Fibonacci numbers, you probably come across this, perhaps notice it yourself. And a sequence that does this is called a division sequence. And when you put them together, that's what I'm calling a linear division sequence or linear divisibility sequence. Um, and these have been explored somewhat in the literature, but let me, before getting into the history, talk a little bit more about some examples. So um, our big question will be, can we determine all linear division sequences? Can we classify them all? So this was, one of Richard's favorite questions. And also want to note the other property that's that's great about them is that you have this GCD of um, FM and FN. It's not indivisible by the F of the GCD of M and N, but it's actually equal, which is kind of cool. And what I'm not going to talk about today are elliptic divisibility sequences. So if you look at a point P on a lip, elliptic curve to find over Q, and you look at 2P, 3P, 4P, and, and you're Recurrent sequence, if you like, is going to be the set of denominators, the Zn's. Then they actually have this property that Zm divides Zn whenever m divides n. And you, if you know your elliptic curve theory, you can sort of see that because if after m in iterations um, you're at the point of infinity over Fp, then you will be at two m iterations, three m iterations, etc. So it's not hard to see that um, the Z coordinates of uh, the of the multiples of rational points on elliptic curve are a division sequence, but the, the uh, process is not linear. So it's not going to fall into the rubric of what I'm doing, but there's great work. Um, this is something that was spotted by Morgan Ward back in the 1940s. And uh, there's, a, you know, there's beautiful work by Silverman, Poonin, Einsleider, Everest, Ward, and Kate Stange recently. 
That's not what I'm talking about there. So um, let me give some more examples of linear division sequences. So the Mersenne numbers, it's pretty obvious that two to the m minus one divides two to the n minus one, whenever m divides n. Maybe if you're not a big person on recurrent sequences, it's not so obvious it is a recurrent sequence, but there you can see the recurrence relation. And um, what you notice, there's an underlying polynomial x squared minus three x plus two, and the roots of that are the two and the one. So in 1878, as I mentioned in the abstract, the very first journal in um, the United States of America in mathematics was the American Journal of Mathematics. And the first edition was um, 1875 to 1878. Um, and Luca in French, no less, wrote um, 80 odd pages on recurrent sequences and did a lot of things, actually really interesting things. And um, yeah. So one of the things he noted was the sort of general formula alpha to the n minus beta to the n over alpha minus beta. So you see the Maten numbers are alpha equals two, beta equals one, and you get the Maten numbers. And you, I mean, what, what Luca notes is you can always take conjugate quad, quadratics. And so for instance, you get the Fibonacci numbers. Um, oh, I've got this wrong. That should be plus root five. It's obviously, it's not imaginary. Um, but anyway, you get the Fibonacci numbers by plugging in there. So why do Lucas sequences always give a um, division sequence? Well, one way to view it is you're taking the polynomial x to the n minus y to the n over x minus one. I'm writing it like this. And then just using that, just like we did for Mersenne numbers, numbers, that x to the m minus y to the m always divides x to the n minus y to the m. So that's the simple proof. And I'll notice it's also actually always gives a uh, recurrent sequence because if you take this x and y, you can, again, you can see these are kind of roots of a quadratic equation that forms a quadratic equation, x squared minus x plus y times capital X plus x, y. And so, you know, if any given alpha and beta that are, that are conjugate, you're going to get uh, a nice thing over the integers here. But in general, you can think of it as also as a polynomial linear division sequence where you're substituting in values of alpha and beta. So some less interesting examples of um, linear occurrence sequences would just be a constant times a to the n, and that there's the linear occurrence is just one term. Um, one that, that is not, if, until you see it, obvious, is that n squared, for instance, satisfies this recurrence. Um, if you go to like Tim Gower's lectures on additive combinatorics, he's often using identities like this, for looking at arithmetic progressions and the squares, and for higher degree, and in fact, um, you, you know, these, these coefficients, one, three, three, one, you should recognize obviously as binomial coefficients. And in fact, any degree D polynomial satisfies the binomial coefficient uh, recurrence of degree D plus one. So what's kind of a bit surprising at first sight is that you can take any two linear division sequences and you can multiply them together and get a new one. So for instance, if I take two to the n minus one and fn, well, let me just point out, multiplying two division sequences is kind of obvious, right? If a of m divides a of n and b of m divides b of n, then a m b n divides a m b n. So it's obvious it's a division sequence. It's less obvious it's a linear occurrence, but here's the linear occurrence, the, the smallest one it satisfies, the least order one. And um, you can see this comes out from multiplying the polynomial corresponding to this. I'll talk about these polynomials in a second. Most of you probably know this theory. And the polynomial corresponding to the Fibonacci numbers and getting the corresponding polynomial for the product. So um, let me just give a general proof of linear product linear occurrence is always a linear occurrence. So linear occurrence, you start with what? U0 to UK minus one, and then you, you just iteratively define things. So the Fibonacci's numbers are Fn is Fn minus one plus Fn minus two, we have k equals two. And from this, we, there's a corresponding polynomial. So you just take the coefficients, so you've got this one, and then you bring these C1 to CK on the other side. We'll assume CK is non-zero, otherwise this term wouldn't be there anyway. And then you factor this as a polynomial. And then there's a remarkable formula. It's easy to prove by induction, it's not. It's a triviality to prove, but it's, it's when you first see it, it's pretty cool that um, the nth term in the sequence is given by, um, you take these alpha i's to the n's, and then you have polynomials in n. Um, and perhaps the one thing worth saying is once you have these alpha i's, knowing these 
k coefficients of these polynomials is equivalent to knowing the first k terms here. You can deduce them from each other. So there's a very simple, very general theory of how to build linear recurrence sequences, working with characteristic polynomials. So if I say the word order, it means the smallest such k. Um, you can define this in the ring of in Z, but I could also be in the ring of integers of a number field. I could be of polynomials. I could be of polynomials and many variables. Um, I'm not. I'm going to try and avoid as much as I can the Galois theory that really is living behind what I'm going to talk about today. But just to be clear, um, although I'm looking at sequences over the integers, I'm going to want to factor this polynomial and use the roots. So I'm in the number field um, there. It's obviously Galois because it's a splitting field extension. And um, I'll assume it has ring of integers A. OK, so let's have a look at multiplying linear recurrent sequences. So what we said is if we have a linear recurrent sequence, you get some representation like that, and that gives you all the terms. Now, if I multiply these two together, it's pretty obvious I'm going to get another thing like that, right? The two polynomials are multiplied together, and I'll get alpha i times beta j to the n. So it's obvious that the product is also linear recurrence. So what we did with 2 to the n minus 1 times f of n. Um, but um, we also, as I noted a minute ago, um, that if you have uh, two numbers, two, two sequences that are division sequences, then their product is also division sequence. So it's clear that if you take two linear division sequences, so linear occurrence plus division sequence, multiply them together, you get another one. Um, but here's the first remarkable theorem I want to talk about, which is um, the Hadamard quotient theorem. And that says something rather surprising that rather than multiply together, suppose you have A of it, so always I'm going to assume A of n and B of n are each linear recurrent sequences. And I've got A of n and B of n. And let's suppose the quotient is always an integer. Okay. Then the corollary, then it, it's extraordinary that you can show that this actually is a, a linear recurrence, um, this, this quotient. I'm not sure why it's called the Hadamard quotient theorem. Maybe it was asked by Hadamard, I'm not sure. It was first proved um, by Van der Porten in 1982. And, and you know, I'm a big fan of Al Van der Porten, and he brought a lot of new ideas into the subject, but there's some very, very tricky little details in the subject. And his proof was had some issues. And he sorted out Rumley a few years later. Um, and it's a, it's a hard paper. I mean, it's hard to do. So um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that, that Van der Porten had trouble with later. Um, I also had trouble with them, so quite familiar with them. Um, and uh, this was vastly improved, this theorem, by Kovai and Zanier in 2002, who showed that actually you don't need this always to be true. You just need it for infinitely many n. And then at the very least, you've got that this is a uh, linear recurrence sequence on some arithmetic progression, some sub-progression. And that's best possible. So this is a remarkable, I mean, they, they'd actually, Van der Porten had conjectured that something like this should be true, but it's a long way from conjecture to proof. And this is an amazing step, like Kovai and Zanier, oops. I just mentioned that it's irrelevant to me today, another great theorem from Zanier on linear recurrence. These are probably the best you know, the best theorems on linear recurrence sequences in, last, in my career, I think. Um, so Zanier proved this wonderful conjecture that if you've got a linear recurrence sequence and every term in it is a dth power, then actually you've got some sort of dth root. So there's some Cn, so that An is Cn to the D, and that Cn is a linear recurrence sequence. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of a remarkable result. So um, let me tell you about Corvai and Zanier's main new idea. And actually, all of uh, their work and Zanier's work and others come into this idea. And I perhaps should mention that, um, well, let me, let me say it in a minute. So the, the, let me explain this. So we're going to take a finitely generated multiplicative subgroup of the algebraic closure of the rational. So maybe I'll take all multiples of two, three, five, and seven. OK? So in other words, I can have 2 to the 100, 3 to the minus 27, 5 to the 19, 7 to the 11, and a similar number for you, and for v. And what I'm interested in, so I put n for norm here, but let's just think about it in the integers. Suppose I've got some big product of primes minus 1 here, and where the primes is from some fixed sets, that's what I mean by finitely generated. Similarly with v, 
then the question is, can the GCD of U minus one and V minus one be big? And um, the answer is no, it can't be very big. So here I just mean the maximum of U and V to the epsilon. So um, these really can't get big, except there is obviously a counterexample to that. Suppose that V was U squared, then we see U minus one and U squared minus one had a big common factor. So the only counterexample is if there's um, some sort of multiplicative relation between U and V. So yeah, so that's the theorem. Um, it was inspired by their earlier work, work of uh, a lot of people kind of got involved in this area around that time, Bujo, I think it was the first paper of Kovai and Zanier. Um, the joint paper, Silverman had ideas in this direction, uh, Hernandez and Florian Luca, and there's, I'm probably missing some, it was quite the rage, but this is kind of the, some ways the ultimate form. You can generalize this in some ways, but as a corollary of this. Um, so let me leave that up. And oh, so again, I've got N. So I actually haven't been very careful because I said the GCD, but I've, I had denominators in U, right? I said you could have three to the minus 100. So what I mean is you take the GCD of enumerators of these two, and that's the same in an algebraic number field, but that's, you've got to be a little bit careful in an algebraic number field because you know a rational in an algebraic number field doesn't have a well-defined numerator, right? I mean, you can't, you can't, if you got, if I give you a fraction algebraic number field that's not reduced, that the, there's a non-trivial GCD of enumeration denominator, the GCD might be a non-principal ideal, so I can't divide out by it. So you've got to be, it's, it's a tricky business, the idea of reduced fractions in, in algebraic number fields. So here we've got to just look at the prime ideal divisors of enumerator, and then you can have a well-defined notion of norms. Okay, so let me give you the corollary that's relevant to us, that if you have two multiplicatively independent algebraic numbers, U and V, um, then, okay, so my gamma now is just going to be, well, generated by U and V. And I look at U to the N minus one and V to the N minus one, and then this GCD of numerators, thinking of it as the GCD involving the prime ideals that divide both, um, that is less than e to the epsilon n, so it can't grow exponentially fast with n. So that's the wonderful theorem. Um, and what we saw a minute ago when I described Lukács sequences is that um, I referred back to uh, doing them in terms of polynomials. So um, that's going to be a theme here. So in fact, there was a, an analogous result in with polynomials, a little bit stronger because Obviously, you can work with polynomials a little bit more easily. So there's some uniformity in here in Elon Rudnick. And then uh, our host, um, Alina Mustafe, she proved a similar result um, with general polynomial ring, which I also need in this, um, with more uniformity. In other words, uh, I think Elon Rudnick, they, the polynomials involved, they, this constant involved features of the polynomial beyond just the degree and stuff like very simple things. And Alina's result just involves the degree. Essentially, it's a tiny bit more complicated, but it's very uniform. Okay, so um, what I want to look at is um, this observation that if I have two division sequences, then the GCD is also a division sequence. Um, I mean, if AM divides AN and BM divides BN, then if you think about the GCD, then it obviously divides the GCD of AN and BN. Similarly, the LCM. So the question then is, are they also linear recurrent sequences? And what's kind of cool is if one is and the other is, because remember we proved that a and, if a and b and are both division sequences, then the product is. Now, if this guy's a recurrent sequence, uh, then it divides that. And the Hadamard quotient theorem says, if I divide a and b and by that GCD, I get a new um, linear recurrent sequence. So that's kind of cool. We only have to work feature one of them to work it out. Um, so I'll just work for GCD and I'm gonna use an example and this will give me an opportunity to apply Kovaya Zanier. So with two to the N, well, we know about two to the N minus one in the U to the N minus V to the N minus one. And Fn involves, now I've got them right, the two roots, one plus root five over two, one minus root five over two. And 
you know, the numerator of this is like the Fibonacci number. Um, and here it is the Mersenne number. And Kovaya Zanye says, since these things are, um, are independent multiplicatively, which is not hard to prove, then this cannot grow exponentially, this GCD. Now, let's just remind ourselves, any linear current sequence has this sort of formulation. And then just by some sort of mean square argument, it's easy to show that the size of UN must grow at least as fast as the maximum of the alpha rise to the end. Not always, but you I mean, you could have cancellation occasionally, but for infinitely many n, it has to grow that fast. So in particular, if some alpha i was greater than one, then the UNs would have exponential growth, but that contradicts what we get from Kovaya Zanye. So we know none of the alpha i's can be greater than one. So each of them is less than or equal to one. And then, because um, we're working with the integers, um, we know we have for each alpha, all its conjugates have absolute value less than or equal to one. And there's a famous theorem of Kronecker that says that means that they all have absolute value one. So, um, well, we're calling UN slow growing. And what you see from this formula, if all the alpha i's have absolute value one, then the main growth comes out of the polynomials. So we certainly have that UN doesn't grow faster than n to some power d. But you can just play with this. I mean, if p is a quadratic residue mod five, then we know that p divides fp minus one, obviously. So that's sort of Fermat's little theorem for uh, Fibonacci numbers. And we know that p divides two to the p minus one minus one. So p divides this GCD whenever p is plus or minus one mod five. And from that, I can construct, and here's a construction, an n where un actually grows faster than, than polynomially. Um, so this is where I take those p minus ones, where all the p's are plus or minus one mod five, I take their LCM, and um, all their prime factors are less than root x. So if you know more, the proof we did 30 years ago of Pomerantz and Alford of Carmichael numbers, this sort of thing came up there, this, exactly this construction. Okay, so we've proved that this can't be a linear recurrent sequence because it can grow too fast. And Kovaya Zania says that um, this linear recurrent sequence can't grow fast. Contradiction. Okay, oh, I put on the, on the line, bottom line in red. Okay, so um, yeah, so the question is classify all linear division sequences in the integers. And um, Marshall Hall um, was really the first to write a paper on this, specifically this problem in 1936, where he tried to just do third order. So you have three terms. This second orders are easy enough for Lucas sequences. Um, so he brings up the general problem and, you know, there were older works that kind of worked on this problem, even back to Luca, but without specifying the problem, but it's sort of obviously there, as Paul mentions. So it's a bit hard to date this problem um, in uh, the book, which is I guess, the key book on the subject by Everest, Randall Porton, Balinski and Ward. They just give up trying to give a date to it and just call it very old. Um, so there's not many theorems actually, um, so there's one that's kind of interesting will come up in a bit later that any linear divisibility sequence divides the product of certain Lucas sequences. So that gives some hint that, that is, they're tied in with Lucas sequences somehow. Um, so these are linear division sequences of order two and then maybe times some constant times n to the d. We'll see a proof of this later. There've been a lot of other papers on the subject, um, including Richard Guy. Um, but the main output that's been relevant to the theory are, are surprising and inspiring examples. So let me very quickly do a little classification work. If u n is a linear division sequence, then obviously if I divide by u1, these are all integers, I get another linear division sequence, so I might as well assume u1 is one. I can do the same trick for any d, which is kind of interesting, it turns out to be a useful tool. If, um, u0 isn't zero, we have un divides f divides u0 always. So there's only finitely many possibilities for un. And that means there's finitely many vectors like that. But remember, un is defined in terms of these vectors. So that'll actually make it periodic. Um, OK, so if it's periodic, then you can do something like if uh, B and A have a common GCD with the period. I'll always use M for the period in this talk. Then U of A divides U of RA, right? A divides RA, which is U of B. U of B divides U of SB, which is U of A. So U and A and U and B are plus or minus each other. So with a periodic thing, you get something 
um, very, very simple, really. Everything's defined in terms of what happens between 1 and m. And those guys just depend on the GCD of a and m. So I just want to make one example, which is if I pick 1 everywhere except integers divisible by 3, that's obviously a recurrent sequence, linear recurrent sequence. It's obviously a division sequence, but it's not the product of loop class sequences. So the uh, periodic linear division sequences make it a little difficult to classify things. But one might guess maybe every linear division sequence is a product of C n to the d's and periodic linear division sequences and Lucas sequences. I think that was kind of what people thought, especially after this paper of uh, Bezevin uh, and uh, Van der Porten. I mentioned them in the interview, but Van der Porten. Um, I mentioned this stuff about slow growth. And I'm just going to talk about some trivial other trivial trivialities. So this first part, un is sigma ray ud, where sigma ray is plus or minus one, is the periodics. But I could multiply through by, um, by some sort of polynomial and still get a linear division sequence. And this classifies all of them like that. It's not a very hard proof. And if other boring ones is I could also multiply through by a constant to the n minus 1. And then over the periodic ones, constant to the n over d minus 1. So there are constructions from periodicity, add a polynomial, add a c to the n minus 1, have respect for the periodicity. And this is what I'm going to call a boring linear division sequence. So um, we might guess that all linear division sequences are the product of a boring linear division sequence and a Lucas sequence. Well, we might have guessed that. And I should say, I think literature pretty much did guess that. Um, but then um, there was a very surprising paper in 2014. So in 2014, Peter Bala proved, looked at this sequence. So this is known as Lucas sequence or the companion sequence of the Fibonacci numbers. So it starts 2, 1, 3, 4, but satisfies the same linear occurrence as the Fibonacci's. Um, and here's the explicit formulas for both of them. And uh, Bala proved that it's a linear division sequences sequence. And I'll note that it's not a product of Lucas sequences. One can prove that. Um, and boring linear division, division sequences. So that, that conjecture that had sort of been around and half enunciated in papers is wrong from this example. Um, let me just show you my proof of why this is a linear division sequence. Well. I'm going to write this as uh, a polynomial in alpha and beta. Um, and here, what I'm going to do, well, the x plus y, the alpha n to the plus beta at the n, and the um, x cubed minus y cubed gives you this thing, because um, it was f3n here. And um, yeah, so we get the, this linear recurrence sequence out of this ratio. And um, yeah, so now, before, remember, I just used x minus y, and I said x to the n minus n y to the m divides x to the m minus y to the n is obvious. That's true. Is it, is it obvious that when I plug in m and n in here where m divides m that f with x to the m and y to the m divides f with x to the n and y to the n? I think the answer is not at first sight. Um, but here's the trick. I can actually view this as the least common multiple of these two polynomials when I'm working over z of x, y. So, I said, I, we proved before that with 2 to the n minus 1 and f of n, that it's not necessarily the case that when you take the GCD or LCM, you get a new linear division sequence or new linear occurrence was the problem. But it turns out in polynomials, you do. So in polynomial rings, you can take GCDs and you can take the LCMs of linear division sequences and get new ones. And so that's what you get here. I mean, it's pretty obvious. This is going to give you, as described, a, a uh, linear occurrence. And then from what we said earlier about LCMs, it's obvious it will retain the fact it's a division sequence inside the ring of polynomials. And so this is a proof of um, Bala's result. And so what we have is there's a nicer structure of polynomials than there is of integers that you can take GCDs and LCMs of linear division sequences of homogeneous polynomials and get linear division sequences. And then you can substitute in and get something for integer sequences. That's pretty cool. That gives us kind of a new tool that wasn't there. So what we've seen is Lucas sequences are specializations of this thing. 
And Bala's example is the specialization using F is this LCM. And then once you see this, you think, well, if, if LCMs work, then I should do more. So um, yeah, and I can dehomogenize, just think of it as stuff happening in, in polynomial rings. So um, yeah, so I can just generalize this as much as I like. I mean, finitely many of these non AKs non zero. And this is going to be a linear division sequence when I you know, do this sort of action with it. Um, and in fact, Koshkin in 2019 showed these are the only linear division sequences in C of T of this precise form. He actually wrote it in a different form. So it's a bit, takes some work to show my version, his are the same, but they are. Um, in fact, there are more um, linear division sequences in C of T. They're not all of its form, but this, they're kind of all a similar idea. I'll, I'll describe a little bit more about them in a minute. So maybe all linear division sequences are part of a boring linear division sequence and not Luca sequences, but which we know now is wrong, but specializations of polynomial linear division sequences. So let's just think about how do we go from a linear division sequence over the polynomials to a linear division sequence in Z. Well, we start with these kinds of things. So I'm actually gonna take a bunch of these polynomials and here's, here I'm showing you how you can get more polynomials that are linear division sequences um, in a polynomial ring because I could bung in a algebraic number in there like uh, root of unity. So I can throw in some roots of unity, take the LCM. This is also a linear division sequence. Um, Okay, so I have some polynomial that's that, you know, when I put in these nth powers, I get a linear division sequence. I can homogenize back to have two variables. Um, then I can specialize with putting in alpha and beta. And then I have linear division sequence in some number field. In fact, the ring of integers of some number field. And then I take the norm to get integers. So fairly straightforward program. So let's just, I want to look at this last step about taking norms. So if I've got a linear division sequence in um, some number, a ring of integers of some number field, then I can just take the norm and get a linear division sequence in Z. So let's try it for our favorite example. I'll take alpha n minus beta n over alpha minus beta, where alpha and beta are um, you know, from Fibonacci numbers. And when I take the norm, I'm producting this together twice. So I get f of n squared. So this isn't actually going to give me everything. Um, so I mean, it's obvious what the problem here is that the Galois element swaps alpha and beta. So I need to take a set of representatives of the Galois group modular the stabilizer of these two elements. So that's not a big deal, but it's a minor technicality one's got to sort out. Let me show you another one that is really quite fun. So when I'm working over the integers and I've got six to the n minus three to the n of six minus three, so six and three are my, my roots, characteristic polynomial, then I can sort of see that I can, I can just get rid of this big GCD that's lurking there. So let me show you that, an example in uh, a number field. So oh, I'm going to look back, hello? There's a question. Is it, it is not hard to bound the degree of a product to linear recurrence sequences, but if A of N and B of N are linear recurrences and N. Um, Yes, yes, you can, but um, let me not get into that there. But there's an algorithm by which you can proceed to find the, the ratio, yeah. Um, that was in response to the chat. Anyway, let me continue with this, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so well, I'm doing the same sort of thing here, but I have this problem now that if I want to divide out by the GCD, um, it's non-trivial. There is, there is a GCD of three and one plus root minus five over two but it's actually a non-principal ideal and it's prime. So I can't like divide, take out some principal factor. Um, so that, okay, who cares? But now I'm going to take the norm and um, let's take the norm. So I do that times it's conjugate. And then when I look at the terms here, I see a three in every term, a three to the N, right? So now I can divide out by three to the N, but I couldn't divide out back here. So when I do that, I get you know, something straightforward and it turns out it's linear division sequence. It's a bit weird at first sight to see these four terms together and that gives you one, but you can see from the construction, it is likely to be. 
Um, so it turns out you can't divide out GCDs from individual terms when you, you do this kind of construction, but you can from the product. Um, and of course, I took this example from everybody's favorite textbook example of uh, non-unique factorization, which is where three times two is one plus root five, one minus root five, you can see all the terms there. And that, that gives you this nice example. So you could object that maybe I could just say, well, I know that uh, the class number here is two. So I could square the ideal and get a principal ideal. And so every second term I could divide out a GCD. In general, I would have to work with the class number. And so you could do something, you could, you could jury rig something up like that, but I think it'd be rather complicated to keep track of it all. Okay, so let me give you, let me just talk a little bit more about this example. I got it from a paper of Guy and Williams. Richard Guy was 95 years old at the time um, and still doing fantastic research. So he was interested in the following problem, which is um, how do you place dominoes on a four by n minus one rectangle? It turns out n minus one is the right normalization. Um, so yeah, so I mean, four by one, you can just put the two n by n, but once, as soon as you got four by two, you've got all sorts of ways to place them. And it turns out that um, four by two, there's 11 ways. And um, yeah, so there's this, this linear, this uh, recurrence relation for, the number of ways. And um, the characteristic polynomial factors in an interesting way. And what Guy and Williams noted is that um, this is an example where um, the roots alpha, beta, gamma, delta satisfy this, right? It's kind of obvious alpha, delta, beta, gamma. This is the conjugate of that. And so they noted this is linear division sequence. And I think they thought, and, and maybe, and I thought certainly when I looked at the paper that this showed that Luca sequences are wrong, but it is actually an example of what we had in the last slide, rather strangely. So as, as I said in the last slide, you can't see the product until you multiply things, scale things up, and then you divide out this divisor. So there's tricky business around here. So we have to, our general algorithm, we take something like this, we take the norm. Well, we don't quite take the norm. We have to take a set of representatives, the so Galois group modulo stabilizer. We divide through by an appropriate GCD and we get what we might call polynomially generated linear division sequence in the integers. And so maybe the conjecture is all linear division sequences are the product of boring linear division sequence and a polynomial generated linear division sequence. Um, well, I haven't talked about degenerate sequences where some, uh, some uh, ratio of roots in the characteristic polynomial is a root of unity. So here's a, annoying sequence. So it's one on the odd numbers, t to the n minus one on even numbers. And this has general formula here. You can see the t to the n minus t to the n, their difference is a uh, root of unity, multiplicatively. And so you tend to get structures like this as a nice one of odd and even going the other way, because you can combine them. But all of these are degenerate. And we don't like degenerate things because it can cause an amazing calculation, a cancellation of the formula. So here, when n is odd, these two terms cancel. And so you get something like that. And so it's hard to work with. So typically in literature, people work non-degenerate case, which leads to no cancellation. But I'm not going to do that for technical reasons. But um, often people will go to the non-degenerate. So um, you can't, I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'm not going to go into this at length. But if you've got something degenerate, you can understand what happens on each arithmetic progression and rebuild things just by the normal kind of way you work with such things. Um, so you might ask, are all linear division sequences the product of boring linear division sequence, polynomial generated linear division sequences, but constructed like this on each arithmetic progression mod M, which we saw might be necessary. And the answer is yes. Um, so you understand now why the literature has had problems with this question in the it's very, very hard to decide what the eventual answer is. And you come up with a perfectly plausible idea and then you find an example that takes you to another direction. So it took me a long time to do this um, and the proof was terrible. So um, you can simplify this a bit and you can come up with the following classification theorem that every linear division sequence in the integers is the product of a boring one and specializations of linear division sequences in uh, the homogeneous polynomials divided by appropriate GCDs. Okay, so let me give you an idea of how we attack this problem. 
So I'm just going to work in the simplest possible case now where the where all integers, the uh, things we're taking powers to, the constants are probably integers. So you know, I'm not dealing with complications. I want to show you Barbaro's 2017 proof of Beza van Petto and van der Porten. Um, so here's the idea is um, if un divides, if un divides u2 and u3 and u4n, it's a uh, division sequence, then um, what we have is that each of these, when I put an n, 2n, 3n, they're all congruent to zero mod un, which I can write as a van der Monde system, right? They're just a to the 2n, a to the 3n, a to the 4n times these coefficients. And if I assume these coefficients have GCD1, which I might as well just pull out a factor, um, then we see that the determinant's got to be zero mod un. And so that gives us um, this theorem of Beza van Petter and van der Porten that un divides the, uh, the determinant of the van der Monde. So that's pretty cool, but I kind of the subject was kind of stuck with that theorem, and which makes you think, oh, well, you know, it's all about. Um, it's all about Lucas sequences. I mean, that's what they, they look at, like things like this. Um, so that's what we need to understand. But it was very hard to just see what we had to remove from here to get the UN. So the, my first observation was to approach this a little bit differently, the same idea, was um, suppose that, well, what we see here, sorry, let me go back. If I've got a prime P dividing UN, it divides this product, so it divides one of these terms. So ai to the n, aj to the n are congruent mod p for some i and j. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to group the ai to the n's by the residue class mod p. So when I do that, um, I have a partition of 1 to k. I've, I've reorganized them, so the, the distinct residue classes come the first few. And what's going to be useful is to for each of these sets is to take the sum of the coefficients up there. Now look at u of rn. So I take, this is just partitioning the original sum up here, but now into these classes. Now mod p, these ai to the n's are aj to the n's. And then I've just got the sum over the coefficients. So I've got another van der Monde system. It's a little different because now I've just got these h things. But in this case, all of these aj to the n's were chosen to be different. So this determinant's no longer zero. That means each of these gij's is zero mod p. So now we get new information. Now, if gij is not equal to zero, then there's only finitely many primes dividing it. So I'm just going to throw away, I'm not going to work with the primes that divide some non-zero sum of coefficients. I'll only work with the other primes. And in that case, when a prime divides un, we've got this deduction, but it's not a prime that divides a non-zero gij. So the only possibility is that g of ij is zero. So what have I proved? I've proved that, for, um, that there are subsets of these coefficients whose sum is zero. So very quickly, um, when I just plug that in, I can because the subset sum is zero, I could just plug, subtract zero times AJN. And what I see is that UN is divisible by this big GCD. And um, that's divisible by P. And so uh, what if P is a large prime? So Govani and Zanye said, if you have a GCD of things like this that's big, then the only way it can happen is if they're multiplicatively dependent. And actually it's easy to use that theorem and say if there's a bunch of different things like this, you get the same uh, result. So by Kovai Zanye, all of these are multiplicatively dependent. So that's a bit of a shocker. You kind of have that. So what does that tell you? That if they're multiplicatively dependent, then I can just plug in. And then I'll just think of this as a variable, the R to the N, it's a polynomial. I get this. And what I see is that this UN is divisible by r to the n minus one. So again, what have I shown? What have we shown? We've looked at these sets where um, these things are congruent mod p. We're looking at this big GCD. We know it must look like r to the n minus one, the GCD. So we actually have r to the n minus one divides u of n. 
It's sort of like we're factoring out a polynomial. And if you like, we're factoring out something that looks a bit like a Lucas sequence. So that's sort of the um, remarkable thing that happens. Now, I did this with one prime, but you could have many primes that whose product is bigger than e to the epsilon n. So um, question is, can we account for the whole si the size of all of u of n like this? And well, to make this work in general, we need something to do with algebraic numbers, we're gonna use prime ideals. Then there's a the notion of size of prime ideals, which is a tiny bit tricky. You've got these complicated height functions you've got to work with. Um, you need a version of van der Monde that works for when you've got polynomials in here, but actually that turns out not to be a big deal. That's done in the literature and it can be done nicely. The tough part is what if u of n is actually the product of many small primes to very high powers? And that, that is about 80% of the proof is dealing with one case. Okay, so let me leave that attack and show you a second attack. So what we just saw is that um, we're going to, if we go to division sequence, we're going to find that for some partitions of the terms, the AI over AJI are multiplicatively dependent. So for instance, if I look at this sequence, which is um, a linear division sequence, then the, we can use the six as two times three, and then we see the factor of one minus two to the n times one minus three to the n. So in general, I can write any sum of GIN alpha i to the n exactly as gin, and then the alpha i I can write in terms of, well, here it was easy enough to see the, uh, the basis of the alpha i's multiplicatively, it's just two and three. In general, there's some multiplicative basis um, for the alpha i's, and we may have some roots of unity involved, but they will be associated for period. And these are all very independent. So actually I can work with this like I'm working with a polynomial. So I can just replace the beta to the ends by independent uh, variables. So what I'm going to do is try and understand the divisibility of the u ends by understanding the visibility of a corresponding polynomial. So here's, here's the way I've kind of set it up. I'm going quite fast. I'm sorry, I'm going about five minutes. I need to get this done. So um, let's have a look. So we've taken the UN and we've written these GINs in terms of this, where we've got these, the alphas are um, in terms of uh, a basis, multiplicative basis, oops. So uh, let's have a look. If I've got UN is VN times WN as linear current sequences, then it means these polynomials look like UA equals VA times WA. And um, well, um, Oh, so in, in response to the question that was in the chat, you could use this to, uh, to bound the degree of um, the quotient. But um, yeah, so by the Hadamard quotient theorem, if UN divides UKN, okay, then I can write UKN as UN times VN for some linear occurrence. And then I can just use these polynomials and I get something like this. So I've got this U of X divides U of X. Okay, well, forget the subscript depending on the roots of unity. Maybe I should, for expositional purposes, I should just assume there are no roots of unity. So we're gonna take these polynomials U of X. We know they must divide U of X to the K for every K. And that is gonna be a very weird class of polynomials. So that's what we need to get into. And um, interestingly, that was a subject of interest to people in the 1920s and 30s, Rick Goran, uh, McCall, and then there's a the more recent work of Everest and Van der Porten, but Goran's really, I mean, Rick gets all the credit, but actually Goran's paper is very beautiful. Um, if you really like this subject, look at his paper. Um, so this is what we want to understand is if we, we put in nth powers in place of these, um, how does this factor? In fact, in, in Rick and Goran, they, they actually have different powers and different variables, but we don't need that. So one thing to note is if I've got an irreducible thing like this and, and it factors, then I can just replace x by x to the k and get boring factorizations, what I might call old factorizations. So we're only interested in new factorizations the first time a factorization appears. And the theorem of McCall, the thing that's missing, is that if f has um, at least three monomials, then there are only finitely many new factorizations. So um, we find ourselves in the situation that um, 
There's not much new can happen here. And in fact, all the new factors have at least three monomials. So in the case where you have two monomials, so y and z are products of these xi's, then when I take the nth power, I simply get this, and we can factor that into binomials. So binomials factor into binomials when you take the nth powers for the variables, and greater than or equal to three monomials only factor into greater than or equal to three. So in some sense, there's a complete understanding. And what this means in particular, this finitely many new factorizations is, if you plug in a power in here, at some point, the irreducible factors cannot reduce any further when you plug in values. I'm going so fast, but a few people are understanding. So let me just see how this works. Um, if I have this polynomial and I have that u of xn divides u of x2n for all n, then I'm going to claim that u of x actually factors as a product of my monomials and binomials. And so here's the idea. I'm going to write it as a uh, product of monomials, binomials times the irreducible factors of bigger with, with three or more monomials. Then just plugging in that mu, so from that point onwards, you, you get no new factorizations. I get binomials times multinomials, if you like, divides binomials times multinomials. So comparing irreducible factors, this divides that. Now, they don't reduce any further. They've got the same number of irreducible factors, so you can just pair them, um, right? I mean, if, if f of x divides g of x and they have the same number of irreducible factors, they're the same. But this clearly has bigger degree unless they're constants. So we've just proved that f must be a constant. So u is the product only of monomials and binomials. Whew. So finally, what do these binomials look like? Well, something like this. So we end up with u of n looks like c n to the d times some gamma zero to the n, where gamma zero is some multiplication of the betas, which are multiplication of the alphas. And then some polynomials, because we're taking factors like this, these binomial factors, in some gamma j to the n when I plug back in the beta. And so this actually, we, all we need is f of u of n dividing u of 2n to get a structure like this using Red's theorem. So finally, the final theorem is if u of n is a linear division sequence of integers, then there's a boring linear division sequence, there's polynomial linear division sequences, and multiplicatively independent algebraic integers so that we actually have a formula for it. Um, and maybe I won't go on. So let me stop there.